Devin Arthurs was a neo-Nazi, but in 2017, he converted to the Muslim faith, and he says his roommates made fun of him for it. So he killed them both. On May 8, 2023, six years after the murders happened, Devin finally confessed his guilt by pleading guilty. This surprising twist came after this intense interrogation. As the interrogation unfolded, Devin dropped some seriously unsettling details that flipped the whole case on its head. Yet what transpires when a man contends that his motive for killing was to safeguard everyone else? Can such a claim be believed? Or do hidden secrets lie beneath the surface, awaiting revelation? Let's embark on this journey together, delving into the life of the man behind this strange claim. It all started on May 19, 2017, when, in the evening, 18-year-old Devin Arthurs was walking down the street in the Tampa Palms neighborhood of Tampa, Florida, gripping a gun in his hand. Things took a really unexpected turn when he strolled into the leasing office at the Hamptons Apartments. With a mix of shock and disbelief, he told the people there that he'd taken the lives of his two roommates. The people around him were totally taken aback by what he said, but what sent shivers down their spines was the sight of that gun in his hand and the unsettling look on the boy's face. He seemed troubled, yet he had this unsettling smile that made it seem like he was almost proud of what he'd done. The property manager was there when this happened. He saw some suspicious-looking spots on Devin's T-shirt that seemed like blood, but he couldn't be certain from where he was standing. Trying to handle the situation, he told Devin to put the gun down and questioned him about who he'd killed. But instead of answering any questions, Devin just walked away without saying a word. In a hurry, the manager called 911 to tell the police what had just happened as he watched Devin walk over to a nearby store called the Green Planet Smoke Shop. Once Devin went inside, his face showed that something was really bothering him, and he seemed very worried. Suddenly, he pulled out the gun and used it to threaten three people, holding them hostage. This caused a lot of noise and confusion in the store as everyone started yelling and trying to run out of the store. Just then, the store owner stepped up and bravely asked Devin what he wanted, pleading for him to let the hostages go. But Devin appeared really confused, as if he couldn't grasp what was happening. After a short while, the police officers from the Tampa police station arrived and persuaded Devin to free the people he'd taken as hostages. Surprisingly, the moment Devin spotted the police, he surrendered and let the hostages go. It's almost like he was waiting for the police to arrive. He kept saying over and over that he had killed his roommates. The police were curious to understand the situation better, so they asked Devin to provide more details about what had happened. Following their conversation, Devin guided them to his apartment where he killed his roommates. To learn more about the details, let's step back in time when Devin Arthurs came into the world on March 18, 1999 in Tampa, Florida. He was a typical kid, simple, regular, and full of curiosity. He loved exploring the outdoors, tasting new foods, and capturing moments with his camera. But then, in middle school, things took an unexpected turn. He began drifting off mentally, displaying signs of being absent-minded, not fully present in his surroundings, and he stopped engaging in conversations or interactions with others. His school teachers would often raise concerns about his lack of social engagement. Devin would often daydream and found it hard to differentiate between his imagination and reality. But his parents, Alan and Laura, believed that a change of surroundings might help him come out of his shell. So after completing middle school, they enrolled him in a Jewish school named Longwood Lyman High School in Orlando, hoping it would help him become more social. However, things didn't quite work out as planned. The new environment felt suffocating for Devin, like it was too tight for him to breathe. This led him to drop out during the middle of his 10th grade year. This was also a time when Devin showed signs of anxiety, experiencing feelings of nervousness or unease. Devin's parents were deeply concerned about him, but they held on to the hope that he'd gradually find his place and grow comfortable in his surroundings. In an effort to help him, they arranged for him to live alone in a Tampa Palms apartment in 2016 when he turned 17. Interestingly, around this time, Devin was involved with a neo-Nazi group called the Adam Waffen Division. It's important to remember this detail when considering his move to the apartment. 
Devon did encounter challenges, but as time passed, he made an effort to settle in his new place. After a little while, three additional members from the same neo-Nazi group, namely Andrew Wunschek, who was 18 years old, Jeremy Himmelman, who was 22 years old, and Brandon Russell, who was 21 years old and also the leader of the group, moved in with Devon. They were able to live there without paying rent, which was a favorable deal for them. However, little did anyone know, this was just the beginning of a dark and troubling series of events. Coming back to the case when the police reached Devon's apartment, they noticed that many people from the building had gathered there. This gave them a strong indication that something terrible had occurred. The apartment itself was in disarray, and inside, the bodies of the two roommates, Andrew and Jeremy, were on the floor covered in blood. Just as the police were about to begin their investigation, another roommate named Brandon Russell came forward. He explained to the police that he'd been away from the apartment all day, and upon his return, he discovered his roommates' lifeless bodies. He believed that someone had shot them. However, the police informed Brandon that they'd arrested Devon because he had admitted to killing his roommates. This revelation surprised and puzzled Brandon, who couldn't understand why Devon would take such an action. After examining the bodies, the police found gunshot wounds to the heads and chests of Andrew and Jeremy. Moreover, the bodies bore signs of physical confrontations, indicating that they might have fought prior to Devon shooting them. Both victims were shot using a WASR-10 assault rifle. As the police were getting ready to search the apartment, Brandon unexpectedly objected and tried to prevent them from doing so. He insisted that since Devon confessed to the murders, they should just put him in jail and there was no need for further investigation. According to Brandon, there was nothing suspicious in the apartment, just books and personal belongings. This strange behavior set off alarms for the police. They began to suspect that something was amiss. When they started searching, they stumbled upon some shocking discoveries that they never anticipated finding in a teenager's living space. These findings hinted at a much darker motive behind the murders. Among the items they found was literature promoting white nationalism and anti-government beliefs. Even more astonishing was the presence of a framed photo of Timothy McVeigh, who was responsible for the Oklahoma City bombing. However, the most alarming find was an assortment of guns, rifles, ammunition, and materials that could be used to make bombs. In the garage, the police uncovered some really dangerous materials, a highly explosive substance called HMTD, lots of ammonium nitrate, and homemade fuses. When they confronted Devin about these findings, he confessed to a disturbing plot. He revealed that their group had been planning potentially dangerous acts, like terrorist attacks, perhaps targeting nuclear plants. All the evidence strongly suggested a significant and risky plan that could have impacted many individuals. So, the police acted swiftly. They arrested Brandon and took both him and Devin to the Tampa police station for questioning. I, um, I'm going to search this out. Well, you know what, you'd be surprised, man. Unfortunately, most of the people that they talk to me about this, they, they, don't, they don't say well, stuff like that. They, so they themselves were not. Yeah, for the well, but I'll tell you what, I, I don't mean to interrupt, yes, sir, but before, before we get into all that, yes, sir, before we get into the meat and potatoes, so to speak, yes, sir. I have to read you some things and go over some, some formalities. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Well, most of my partner gets in here, we'll, we'll, we'll go that, go that route, all right? I'm going to start a record, recording here, so it's all documented and yeah. memorialized, okay? Yeah. During the interrogation, Devin Arthur shared the most bone-chilling facts about the case and the actual reason behind the murders. It turned out to be much deeper than what the police initially suspected. The interrogation began with the usual introduction, and the detective made sure to inform Devin about his Miranda rights. Then the detective started by asking Devin about how he was feeling and what his mental state was like. Before I, get, before I do that, I want to make sure that uh, I'm dealing with an individual here who has a clear mind. Are you under the influence of any narcotics or alcohol no, or any... No, uh, I'm completely so. No. Okay. No prescribed medication, no cold no. medicine, nothing at all? No. Okay. Uh, do you or have you ever been diagnosed with any kind of mental illness or any, uh, anything like that that might prevent you from having a conversation where you understand what I'm saying or understand what you're saying? No, I don't, I've never been prescribed with that. But okay. I, wish, I wish I went to a hospital before... This, I wish I had uh, listened to my family and just like. 
The investigator aimed to confirm whether Devon committed the murders while struggling with feelings of sadness or while under the influence of any commonly used drugs among his generation. They wanted to make certain that he was mentally capable of having a conversation and comprehending the situation. This was to ensure that he understood the nature of the interrogation process. Um, what, buddy? Yeah. When we begin, like, this, yes. when we, um... Go to the jail. Can I please uh, speak to the doctors there? They told me that I can talk to doctors when I get there. Of course, of course. I, I, I don't, I don't run the jail. Yeah. But when we get there, we'll explain. Are you feeling any physical ailments right now? No, all we ever want is, is the honest truth. That's all right. I'll give you, I'll give you that. Okay. These people. Um, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened today. Yeah, take it from the beginning, man. So I remember, I woke up. Devin told them that on May nineteenth, twenty seventeen. He woke up and noticed that Andrew and Jeremy were occupied with some tasks while talking to each other. Due to Devin's history of being associated with a neo-Nazi group from a young age when he was just 14 years old, he formed a friendship with Andrew and Jeremy because they all held extreme beliefs. However, a few months before the events of May 19th, Devin made a significant change by converting to Islam. He made this change because he believed that embracing Islam would help him find a peaceful and calm state of mind. There were moments when Andrew and Jeremy would mock Devin for his decision to embrace Islam, but he usually brushed it off. However, on this particular day, their teasing affected Devin deeply. He couldn't control his feelings and engaged in a passionate argument with them. The situation escalated to a point where he lost control and, driven by intense emotions, used a rifle to shoot them. Overwhelmed by what he'd done, he left the apartment in a state of shock. Yet there were additional undisclosed reasons that Devon was expected to reveal. Yeah, well, well, tell me about that. What's, what's that all about? Adam Waffen Division is, is a terrorist organization. It's a neo-Nazi organization that I was a part of before I converted. So what's it called? Adam Waffen Division. Okay. And I remember, uh, and I remember my roommate Brandon. He's alive. The guy that was in the American uniform. Uh -huh. I hope he gets his shit together. I hope he gets his life together. He's a good person. But the things that they were planning were horrible. They're planning bombings and stuff like that and count on countless people. They're planning to kill civilian life. Well, do they, were they specific in their plans? Um, power lines, nuclear reactors, uh, synagogues, things like that. And the reason why, like, I mention this is because in, in self evident you go into the place, like, there's a giant Azov Regiment flag that's in the background. Azov Regiment is an organization in Ukraine, which is an NS movement that crucifies people and it's harmed a lot of people that came directly from there. I was very, very angry about the coalition bombing. So, I mean, that day I was watching videos of infants that were killed by American bombs. Which day was that today? Uh, yeah, and that's what it was driving me crazy. It's like, that was getting me. And I was also seeing the posts that was being made in an encrypted chat by other members about how they want to kill blacks and how they want to kill... Members of what? Which the other? same organization, sir. Yeah. Which organization? Adam that? Buff and the that, so that one, the one that you were formerly a part of. Yeah, formerly a part of. And I was living there because I was living primarily with the guy in the American uniform, the Brandon, he right. was, and he's a, he's a decent human being that can be reasoned with. What exactly did you say? Or they, they would say stuff like, I want to blow up refugee ships. They would say stuff like they want to go target like blacks, like how Dylan Roof did. These people, they were, were not just innocent people. They weren't just my roommates, is what I mean. Have they ever done any bad things they do? I mean, specifically that you know about? Maybe you were a part of it, you weren't I was never a part, I was, uh, we never targeted anybody, but we had plans. We had guys in the American military that literally, literally would go to, go to, like, bases and steal huge amounts of equipment. We're talking Kevlar, night vision, stuff like that, for the intent of, uh, of criminal activity, i.e., you know, targeting government structures, targeting people. This is a part of the group that you were, uh, the group that you were a part of? Or? Yes, sir. Um, not to mention, um, like... Uh, like the morality of this group and how these people think. I remember um, I, and I did this in the past, I remember when I, we would help Azov Regiment in Ukraine by hacking telecommunication networks that were held by the separatists, right? So we hacked factories and we shut down electricity. And I remember there was an article that a factory got shut down and a dozen people had died, like frozen to death, and I was horrified by that. I was absolutely mortified. Because you were a part of that. Yeah, I was mortified. I remember, and I, it was horrifying because I knew that nothing would ever come out of it. I would wake up each morning. My mom would tell me, like, good morning, and they had no idea. And I remember, uh, I remember I brought this up to a few people, 
they're a part of the organization, and they just started laughing about it. They thought it was the funniest thing, and I was horrified by it. And it's like, you know, I'm such an idiot for still living in that situation, for being in there, being at that apartment. A short while ago, Devin was the person who'd taken the lives of two individuals, yet his image suddenly changed to that of a hero who potentially prevented further harm. However, a question arose. If Devin was aware of their malicious intentions from the beginning, why didn't he inform the police after he converted to Islam and distanced himself from their group? Instead, he chose to wait, and ultimately, he believed that the only solution was to end their lives. This aspect of the story didn't align well with his claims of wanting to protect others. If his intentions were indeed positive, he could have come forward sooner. Clearly, Devon had much more to share, so the detective allowed him to talk without much interruption. The unsettling details Devon revealed would all be thoroughly investigated. It's hard to describe. I wish that if I could go back and do something over, I would sign myself into a hospital to work about my anger issues and my, and my rational thinking skills which I don't think is, is at par of like... But I think this goes beyond anger issues. I think yeah, it's something a little, a little deeper for you. I think it's more of a, uh, it's a passion that you, you are in, you're passionate about doing good for, for people. At this point, the detective changed the way he talked to Devin using a method called the Ego Up Technique. To use this technique, the interrogator adopts a tone of voice that's almost admiring or praising when talking about the suspect or the crimes they've committed. This is done in a way that seems believable. The purpose is to make the suspect feel proud of what they've done, which might encourage them to admit to their actions and reveal the real truth behind the situation. Let me ask you this, this is my, and forgive me, but I'm just trying to keep trying to, and you're, kind of, you're educating me in this whole process, so yeah. I'm going to ask questions to the student sitting here that is... You believe, you have a faith, you said. What is your faith? I'm a Muslim. Okay. Does that coincide with this organization you're no, part of? No, not at all. So how long have you been a Muslim? I've been a Muslim since uh, June of 2016. That's why I was a part of it. It was mainly to try to get people away from the shit and try to basically... Uh, That's when you fed, when you first joined up? No, this is when, no, I was already part of it when I converted. I just, like, when I converted, I was like, I got it. While I'm in here, I can't just leave it. If I left it, then I'd probably be killed or something like that. But if, uh, if I, I'd either be killed or something in that nature. Um, but if I didn't do that, then when it comes down to it, like, it's, uh, then I might as well try to convince people while I'm there, like, almost, like, basically convince people, like, don't. Don't do this. Don't throw your life away. But you made no secret about it to even Brandon, I imagine, of your faith, right? They mm -hmm. knew they knew what you were about. Yeah. And they still, I mean, they still tolerated you. Yeah, they still tolerated. Yeah, they did. Barely. Devin told the detective that his roommates tolerated him even though he was a Muslim. This raised a concern for the detective. If Devin's roommates had negative feelings towards people of his faith and had harmful intentions, it seems strange that they allowed him to stay with them. If his roommates were truly dangerous and plotting to harm many, it seemed odd that they didn't take any action against Devon. If they were capable of planning to kill numerous people, they could have easily harmed Devon and gone ahead with their sinister plan. This aspect of the story didn't quite fit together logically. I'm telling you stuff that the FBI should also be hearing. Okay. And I'm not... I'm, I'm telling you things that... You know, agencies all over America, uh, all over, like, the, I'm, I'm not trying to sound like a schizo, because I know that I'm trampling over words and stuff. No, no, no you, like, like, you, you were, well, you're within control, man. You're, all right. you're, you're good. Keep yeah. going. And these people, I mean, I, I know, like, in Russia, in Belarus, in, in uh, Ukraine, we were talking about people that are embedded with NATO forces, and NATO's not even aware of it. People that uh, literally crucify people and burn them to death in the middle of, of Ukraine because their POWs captured by the by uh, by captured from separatist forces. Um, and it's horror like there's people in uh, in Germany like plan like basically planning to place IEDs and stuff like that on road uh, on roads in Dunkirk and near Berlin and stuff like that to target refugees on buses and things like that. I know we're talking on a broader scale and, and I and I get can you can you 
bring you back to, to let's just talk, well, not just America, I'm going more specifically now. Let's talk about your condo, the four of you guys condo. in that condo. Let me, let's back you up to when you converted. What led to your conversion? What what was that epiphany you had when you, did you come across anything? I remember, my, uh, I remember I came across the Quran and started reading it. I was like, this is far better than Mein Kampf. This is far better than any of those, any of those. Uh, How did you come across the Quran in the first one? Uh, it was given to me. I remember I visited a mosque. I wanted to see what it was about. I wanted to see if what I was told was true. And uh, I was wrong about what I believed about those people. I was wrong about how I felt about certain races of people. I realized that, you know, there's no point in having lingering hatred and stuff like that. There's no point in wanting to kill a man or a little girl just because she's black or, or Asian. And um, I remember I really held on to these beliefs. And it, that really clicked to me, and I started reading into it, and I found the miracles of the Quran and the, the things that really got it. And that's what really like sparked my interest into it. That's what really got me. Did you have any guidance from anybody else that was maybe more uh, you know, familiar with the faith? And more not kind of, just self-taught. Self-taught. As Devin talked about his conversations, he shared that he changed his perspective and didn't see a reason to harm people just because of hate. He strongly disagreed with what his roommates believed. He even brought up schizophrenia, mentioning that he wasn't trying to sound like that. Devon truly believed that the killings he carried out were for a noble reason, and he didn't do anything wrong that deserved punishment. He felt sure the detectives would accept his story, which made him confident about being released. What, what was their purpose for doing that? Oh, what would, because they wanted, they wanted to go forthright, they're delusional. Man. Okay. And they, uh, and like absolutely delusional. Are there drugs involved? I mean, no, there's no drugs involved. This is all, this is all, uh, Unadulterated, just thought, just this, 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 just their irrational thought. It's Naturally. not just their irrational thought when they're like built, getting the explosives together. When they're like, so when they're Bert, when they have a guy in the U.S. Army uh, go that re-enlisted specifically for the group. This being Brandon. No, not Brandon. This is somebody else in, in the Midwest, so in Colorado, I think. Who's that? Uh, Jason. And Who's Jason. Last name? Uh, I don't know his last name. Okay. But he. Um, he re I'm just giving an example. So oh, okay. Here. Like he he re-enlisted specifically for the group to go into his uh, to go into his supply room and steal stuff like steal night vision goggles, take you know huge met like metric uh, tons of ammunition as time went on. He planned on doing that, and he did do that. He got killed. about Brandon? Because Brandon's uh, Kevlar, currently in he a... joined he joined specifically for the knowledge and the training, and he wants okay. to use that training against the government. He did. He doesn't care about the United States. I mean. He literally had an American flag at the front door that you trample on every time that you walk in. Like literally, uh, they these people join the military specifically to get training, to get access to equipment, and get access to being able to kill people, and they um, and to be more efficient at doing so. No evidence was discovered indicating that any form of training had actually occurred. Devon had provided a lot of information, and many things that he mentioned could have easily been obtained from the internet. Sorting out what was true from what was made up might take some time due to the complexity. Additionally, back in middle school, Devon exhibited signs of struggling with distinguishing between reality and fantasy. This could potentially be a factor if Devon had committed the murders while being influenced by a distorted perception. Did you guys ever sit down together and plot out the operation? Yeah, you mentioned the alligator out. Is there some plans that that's yeah, it's plot. not going to happen anymore. But no, no, you've taken care of that. But I mean, what were those plans? What were the plans? Plans uh, were all said verbally. Things were not written down or, or typed specifically because of this reasoning. However, okay. it's a giant map of the United States where we frequently go there and we would plan and we would look at like streets and roads and stuff like that. I would not actually plot anything. It would be just conversation. Yes, verbal. And um, I wouldn't go into that map and see things circle around. Yeah, there's nothing circle around. Push pins, put in certain targets or anything like that. Nothing, yeah, nothing like that. Okay. And cause, exactly because of this reasoning. Following the interrogation, the detective was confident that Andrew, Jeremy, and Brandon were undoubtedly involved in planning something dangerous that could have harmed a whole community. However, it's important to acknowledge that Devon, despite having prevented a harmful event, still took the lives of two individuals. As a result, he needed to face legal consequences and be confined to jail. Brandon Russell faced arrest in 2017 on federal charges related to explosives and ended up serving five years in prison. He was released in 2022. Surprisingly, this year, in 2023, he found himself arrested once again. This time, federal authorities claimed he teamed up with a woman in Maryland for a plot involving an attack on an electrical power grid. This case is still in progress, 
leaving people intrigued about the unfolding developments. The murder case against Devin Arthurs stretched out for several years, mainly due to concerns about his mental well-being. There were two occasions when he was declared unfit to face the court proceedings and was sent to a state psychiatric hospital for treatment. After over a year of getting help, he returned to the local jail to wait for the trial. Mental health experts assessed him and found that Devin was possibly on the autism spectrum. He was also diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, a mental illness that has aspects of both schizophrenia and mood disorders. In 2023, six years after the murders occurred, a defense lawyer named Maria Dunker shared in court that a mental health professional had recently assessed Devin and determined that he was mentally capable of admitting guilt. Devin Arthurs reached an agreement with state prosecutors and confessed to lesser charges, including two counts of second-degree murder and three counts of kidnapping. As part of this agreement, he accepted a 45-year prison sentence. Once he completes his prison term, he's also agreed to serve 15 years of probation. The judge, Christopher Sabella, further ordered him to follow any recommended mental health treatment after his release. During the proceedings, Devon, with a red beard and wearing a red jail uniform, sat upright and spoke at length. He offered apologies to the families of the two men he killed and strongly criticized extremism and hate. He expressed his desire to be an advocate against extremism and sent a message to the world to stay away from extremist groups. He conveyed his deep regret for everyone affected and everything that had transpired. Devin shared that he'd been influenced by extremist groups and mentioned his experiences with drugs. He pledged to spend his life helping others to avoid such negative influences. He believed he could honor Jeremy and Andrew by being a better person and acknowledging feeling regret for disappointing his family, himself, and his country. Jeremy Himmelman's sister, Riley Borghetti, observed the court proceedings via video call. She spoke directly to Devin and mentioned that he seemed to be dealing with mental illness. She didn't have insight into his life experiences that brought him here, but she wished him healing. After her brother's death, she committed to raising awareness against extremism. In a case that sheds light on the complex intertwining of extremism, mental health, and tragic consequences, Devin Arthur's story serves as a chilling reminder of how lives can be profoundly affected. What are your thoughts on this case? What were the real factors that led him down this path? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.